maybe you're here because you just watched the trailer for the new Five Nights at Freddy's movie and you're intrigued but a bit confused. Or perhaps you're getting excited for the new Security Breach Ruined DLC and want a quick refresher on the story thus far before hopping in. Or maybe you got tricked into thinking this was a game theory video. Whatever the case, it's clear that you're all here for the same reason. You want to understand the story of Five Nights at Freddy's. Now, I am far from the first person to attempt to untangle this web of 8-bit minigames and questionably canon novellas that is the plot of Five Nights at Freddy's. And chances are you've stumbled upon some two-hour video essay or a five-part miniseries on the topic, got about 15 minutes into it, and then got distracted and opened up another video in a new tab, fully intending on coming back to this FNAF thing at some point, only it never did, and now that tab's been open for the past two months, lost in a sea of tabs forgotten to time. Eh, don't worry, we've all been there. But today, I say enough is enough. Today, you can finally close that tab for good. Today, I explain the entire story of Five Nights at Freddy's in less than 20 minutes. I don't, I don't actually know how long it's going to be yet. Richard, you'll, you'll take care of it in post, make me look smart? Great. Then hit that intro. Now, all of these plot synopses that would make Endgame think a bit much might lead you to believe that this story is exceedingly complicated, but I'm going to let you in on a little secret. It's actually incredibly simple. One of the simplest stories ever told, perhaps. It may be shrouded in a fog of examining font colors and comparing animatronic foot shapes, but strip all that away and you are left with a classic three-act story. If you haven't heard of the three-act story structure before, you've definitely seen it in action. Nearly every story ever told, from the epic of Gilgamesh to the Emoji movie, follows this simple structure because it provides the most narratively satisfying arc of highs and lows. And FNAF is no exception. Once you understand the three-act story structure, you'll scoff at all those who said this franchise with multiple different encyclopedias written for it was confusing. So let us begin with Act 1, the setup. The main function of this part of the story is to establish characters, settings, stakes, basically just lay the groundwork for the rest of the story to build upon. Though very important, this tends to be one of the shorter acts. Unless you're talking about an indie horror game obsessed with lore, and then it's like 90% of the story. This first act is pretty dense for Freddy's, but luckily Act 1 can be broken up into a few smaller stages to help us keep track of everything. The first is exposition. Here we are introduced to all the major characters. There are quite literally hundreds of characters in this series, but most of them literally don't matter at all. There are really only five people that you need to keep track of, and if we're being honest, it's more like three and a half. It all starts with William Afton and Henry Emily, two businessmen and engineers who open up an animatronic themed diner together. You know, for all those parents who wish the Rainforest Cafe served brunch. Does it serve brunch? I don't care. This was called Fred Bear's Family Diner, which will eventually branch out into the chain of Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria. For this new restaurant, they designed two special animatronics called Springlock Suits, which can basically double as both animatronics dancing around on their own and as mascot costumes so you can interact with the kids. They also happen to be really poorly designed and have like a 50-50 shot of killing whoever's wearing them. But what are you gonna do? William has three kids, the older brother Michael, his daughter Elizabeth, and the younger brother. Now, in a previous video, I made a joke about how this very important character seemingly doesn't have a name yet, but apparently this isn't true. You are all very adamant that this kid does indeed have a name, 
It's just that every single person who commented had a different name in mind. So to keep things simple and easy for everyone to understand, I will be using a different one of these names every single time I refer to him. Evan Afton is terrified of the animatronics because, well, I mean, have you seen them? But despite his debilitating fear, one year he's having his birthday party at the local Freddy's. I guess when your dad owns the restaurant and it's free, you don't really have a choice, phobias be damned. His older brother Michael and his gaggle of friends, being teenagers, aka the worst types of people imaginable, decide to play a little prank and pick up Chris and shove his head into the mouth of the Fredbear animatronic while it's performing. But uh oh, looks like William accidentally installed a hydraulic press into the bear's mouth because it bites down with enough force to crush Joseph's head, sending him straight to the hospital where he will eventually pass away. See, isn't this name thing so much easier to follow? This next part is actually super sad, and I feel like I shouldn't make any jokes about it. As the kid dies, he hears the voice of his brother Michael attempting to apologize for this horrible mistake that he's made. And like, you can tell, Michael's still a kid. He doesn't understand. He can't process what's happening. He's going to be messed up for the rest of his life, and it is just really heartbreaking. William is also sentimental, I suppose, in his own way. In an attempt to console his son, or maybe himself, he tells Ryan, You're broken. I will put you back together. Remember this line, because it's basically William's mission statement for the rest of the series. This event right here is the inciting incident. Without this one thing, the rest of the story does not happen, and it leads directly into the Act 1 climax. In his grief, William puts the blame of his son's death on Henry, the one who worked on these suits with him. Henry was supposed to be an animatronic genius. He should have been able to stop this. He let this happen. Whether in a drunken rage or a pre-planned act of revenge, William kills Henry's daughter Charlie outside of the restaurant. Hey, that's me! Wait, he takes from Henry what he believes Henry took from him, his child. Oh, oh boy, this, uh, this is the same series as that, that cool gator guy with the shades? Yikes, this got dark fast. The Fredbear's security system, who for some reason lo looks like a creepy puppet, all right, uh, it spots the kid lying out in the rain and tries to go out after it, but the water causes it to short out and break down on top of Charlie. This is actually very important because it allows the spirit of Charlie to possess the very metal of the security puppet, letting her live on. This establishes the main big rule for all of the supernatural elements in this series. If you die while in close contact with some metal construct, your soul can possess that metal, resulting in something called Remnant. Now, does this mean that like every single person who got killed by a metal sword or something is now stuck inside of that sword? I mean, yeah, yeah, I think that's the implication here. William, who was never really connected to the murder, realizes that the puppet is acting kind of funky and makes the connection to Charlie. And suddenly, he has a path before him. If Henry's daughter could somehow live on in the form of this puppet, then maybe, just maybe, he could actually fulfill his promise. He could put his son back together. And that brings Act 1 to a close, setting up the grief-stricken mad scientist William Afton as our main antagonist moving forward. He's willing to do whatever it takes to make good on his promise and put his son Franklin back together. An understandable motivation that doesn't justify any of the terrible things he's about to do by any means, but in his mind, it does. And that's the best kind of villain. That brings us into Act 2, Conflict. This is the real meat of the story, where most of the action happens. So, let's check back in with our old pal William and see how he's doing, shall we? Oh, oh it's real bad. Over the next few years, he goes uh, just a wee bit crazy, building a whole bunch of high-tech 
Funtime animatronics designed to capture kids and extract remnant for him to study. Now, it's a bit strange that his plan is to use robots with his name on the blueprints to capture kids from their birthday parties in broad daylight, and he fully expects to get away with it. Uh, but it's even more strange that it totally works, nobody ever questions it, and everything works out great for him. That is, until his daughter Elizabeth gets a bit too close to Baby, this terrifying clown thing, and gets killed. A tragic setback for William, but while most would take this as a sign that they've gone too far, the fact that Elizabeth is seemingly able to possess Baby and live on only adds more fuel to his fire. Proof that what he's doing is indeed possible. And then... Baby kind of disappears from the story. Like she's always she's always kicking around, but she never really never really does anything. At this point, William goes full blown serial killer, using his old Spring Bonnie Springlock suit to lure kids into the back of the various Freddy Fazbear's pizzerias, where he would kill them and stuff their bodies into the animatronics to learn more about remnant and possession. I guess the police just don't exist in this world because the bodies are never found and William totally gets away with it again. Seriously though, like, think about this. We know that these classic animatronics had murdered kids hidden in them a long time ago, fell into disrepair, were fixed up and reused in FNAF 1 where people constantly complained that they smelled like death and nobody ever opened them up. Like, Oh, oh no, Where could, who could have possibly done this? However, while the cops could never catch up to William, eventually karma did. While harvesting the remnant from some of the animatronics to better understand how it works, he inadvertently lets the spirits of those kids he killed out and they chase him around. Freaked out, he jumps into the spring bonnie suit to try and scare the ghosts, I guess. I don't know, but too bad for him, the person who designed these things was also an idiot. And, and also was probably him, so he should have known this. But the spring locks fail, and he gets killed by irony. The end. Only remember the one rule of this series. If you die while in contact with metal, you can possess it. So William might be dead, but he's not gone. And he's also stuck in a rabbit suit for the rest of the story. So that's William done and dusted for now. Let's check back in with Michael, the older brother and our main protagonist for pretty much all of the mainline games. Michael discovers his dad's evil plan while exploring his creepy underground bunker below their house because, again, he literally wrote his name on the murder weapons. Knowing that the cops of this universe are completely incompetent, he takes it upon himself to track down his crazy dad and put a stop to his murder spree once and for all. Maybe Michael can never redeem himself after what he did, but he can at least get some revenge. And this is where we get to the actual games in this game series. More than halfway through the video. Funny that. FNAF 1 and 2 have Michael traveling to different pizzerias under various code names where he knows his dad was killing people, trying to track down any clues to his whereabouts and he never finds any, and they end up kind of being pointless. Oh yeah, and also at some point, uh, Michael gets killed and turned into a, a literal zombie, a detail that seems like it should be super important, but never really comes up again. All of that stuff with William and Michael could really happen in any order, by the way. People are still trying to figure it out, but it's not super important when it comes to understanding Act 3, the resolution, which fittingly enough occurs during Five Nights at Freddy's 3. Set against the backdrop of a haunted house themed after the Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria, a perfect reflection of how twisted William's once paragon of children's entertainment has become. Here, father and son are reunited at last. The man that tore his family apart trying to resurrect one son versus the other that he's been neglecting. And also the dad is rabbit now. 
It's epic, it's emotional, and there was no indication that Michael even existed when the game came out, so it was totally lost on everyone, but it all ends with Michael trapping William inside this fake pizzeria and setting it ablaze, stopping the rabbit man once and for all. Ha <laughs> ha! You thought it was that simple? You fool! This wasn't the resolution, we're still in Act 2! This ain't the conclusion, we're only at the midpoint, baby! Storytelling 101. The hero must fall in the second act of the story. Or, or I guess in this case, Michael, Michael doesn't really lose, he just tries to set his dad on fire, and then William's like, dude, what the hell? And then they're both just completely fine afterwards, and the whole thing was kind of pointless again. But Michael is not to be deterred for long, because remember Henry, the guy that I, I talked about briefly in Act 1 and who seemingly completely disappeared for the bulk of the story? Well, he's back and he's got a great idea for the true third act of this story. His plan is to lure William and the other animatronics that are still kicking around to a fake pizzeria, enlist the help of Michael to trap them inside, and set the whole thing ablaze to finish them off once and for all. Wait, didn't we literally just do that? And so, all of our main characters are brought together for one epic conclusion. William Afton, Michael Afton, Elizabeth Afton, not Gregory Afton, I guess he was busy, Henry Emily, Charlie Emily, and Elizabeth's ex are all locked within the pizzeria as it burns. Everything wrapped up, everything concluded as we close out Act 3. At last, we have our resolution. There is a seventh game, Ultimate Custom Night. This one doesn't really fit into an act per se, it functions more as an epilogue, showing how William's soul was unable to move on to the afterlife and is instead being tortured for all of eternity by his own wicked creations in purgatory. It takes a very bold approach for an epilogue and introduces a brand new character, a vengeful spirit named Cassidy, who was just one of the kids who got killed by William at one point and happens to be possessing the same suit as the crying child. I feel like it would have just been way simpler to just make this the crying child instead of creating a new random character that fulfills the exact same role, but pff, whatever. Gotta have some room over the Sudoku book. And with that, we have reached the end of Act 3. Resolution has been achieved. Only there's one slight issue. See, it's a little known fact, but the name three act story structure is actually a bit of a misnomer. Instead, any good story actually goes a bit further than three acts and doesn't stop at the resolution. So that brings us into Act 4 the part where the villain digitally replicates his own consciousness using very outdated technology so he can live on after death. Classic three-act story structure right there. What, you thought that people loved Winter's Soldier because of its deep characters and personal stakes? Nah, man. It was all about this guy. This brings us to Help Wanted, a VR game set after the fire of FNAF 6 about the digital consciousness of William Afton, known as Glitchtrap, possessing the minds of real-life people who play the VR game. Now, it may seem strange, a computer virus infecting real-life human beings through a VR headset, but it can clearly be connected back to our one big rule because, uh, well, uh, because you see, you, uh, you, you got the remnant right over here, and then, and then over here you, you got, I mean, it's simple as that. This game also starts planting the seeds for Vanessa, a new recurring villain of the series moving forward who gets possessed by this version of William Afton. Seeds that will continue to grow in Act 5, the cash grab. This is the part of the story where the creators attempt to capitalize on the success of the popular phone application Pokemon Go like three years after people stopped caring. A very important step in all stories. This is FNAF AR. Not much happens in terms of plot, but it does continue to flesh out Vanessa as a character in the background. And finally, that leads us into Act 6. The actual, for real this time, Resolution. Before we release more DLC, 
This is where security breach takes place. And in the three act story structure is classically the part where you chicken out on your cool new villain you've been setting up for the past few games because a couple of people on the internet guessed your twist. You know, because you left sensible clues and created a good, interesting, but clear and solvable mystery. Like a good story might do. Instead, for the sake of creating artificial surprise, you choose to fall back on reincarnating an older villain just for them to be defeated once again, leaving the audience with a somewhat empty, disappointed feeling, more questions than answers, and cheapening your previous perfect climax in the process. Y'all think I'm joking, but you seen Rise of Skywalker? Like it or hate it, this is legit. Anyway, Security Breach follows this kid named Gregory who gets trapped within a mega pizza plex and is terrorized by 80s inspired animatronics infected by the glitch trap virus. Vanessa's here too, and boy does she not do a whole lot. It's also heavily implied that Gregory is actually a robotic recreation of Crying Child, first name Crying, middle name Child, last name Afton, William Afton's now long dead son, which sounds absolutely insane at first, and a lot of people thought this was the stupidest idea they ever heard, but if William's goal this whole time really was to put his son back together, then it looks like he just might have been successful, or more likely, someone else built upon his research and did it, because Afton has been a crispy rabbit for decades now, and I somehow doubt that he's, you know, been in the lab using his solder and whatnot to build robot kids. And with that, our story draws to a close. Wipe away all the bites of 87 and the cryptic dialogue and the questions of whether or not Golden Freddy and Fredbear are actually the same thing and conveniently ignoring all the things that don't make any sense, you're left with a very simple family drama. The story of a grief-stricken, rage-filled father attempting to bring back his son, no matter the cost, and his other son trying his best to stop him and also Vanessa was there for a little bit. So go forth, my friends, and watch that FNAF movie. Play that ruined DLC that will inevitably retcon this entire thing again and say that actually it takes place in space and everyone's a shape-shifting alien or something. And finally, close that tab for good.